So, uh, now let us look at the Hadoop specifics for what we have just seen. So, as I said, Google pioneered MapReduce uh, for big data and they used it for a very large number of tasks. Um, in fact, initially their uh, index implementation, Google search index was hand coded, uh, but once the MapReduce uh, was developed, they soon realized that it's best to do even indexing using MapReduce because it, MapReduce paradigm deals with failures. It deals with slow machines. Uh, it can uh, be configured to run on uh, different numbers of machines by just changing some parameter somewhere. You don't have to do any recoding. So it's actually a very convenient paradigm. So they moved their indexing to MapReduce. Um, they uh, did a lot of analysis on MapReduce. So in fact, uh, pretty much all the uh, stuff which analysts are at Google do these days, Google has a lot of people doing analysis, huge. A lot of their employees are doing different kinds of analysis. All the inputs to the analysis are enormous because every single thing that Google does has in, in anywhere from tens of millions to hundreds of millions or billions of users and uh, billions of queries per day. It's gigantic. So everything that they do runs on the MapReduce platform. Uh, now when Yahoo saw this, uh, they decided to uh, actually Hadoop uh, was already being uh, done by a couple of people. It started off as a small project uh, built by two people. Uh, it was called Nutch in those days. Uh, Yahoo saw the potential and they actually uh, hired one of the two people who was involved in Nutch. The other person decided to become an academic, so he is now on the faculty at Michigan. Uh, but the one of the two who joined Yahoo continued developing it and it became called Hadoop. Yahoo put a lot of resources into this. They put a lot of people to develop this and uh, thanks to Yahoo, uh, Hadoop is available and Yahoo decided to open source it, uh, which was also a very good idea because many people started working on this even outside Yahoo. So Yahoo benefited, the world has benefited. So uh, the original Google implementation ran on top of the Google file system, GFS distributed file system. So Yahoo built a equivalent called Hadoop file system, HDFS. Now Google file system is a, a actual underlying file system running on machines. Hadoop file system runs on a number of machines. The underlying storage in each of the machines is the local file system. You may be using whatever Linux or other file system. Uh, but the Hadoop file system, uh, runs a bunch of servers and now it lets you store files in the Hadoop file system and it lets you fetch files from the Hadoop file system. So HDFS is a service uh, which is uh, provided by a code uh, which Hadoop provides. Now in your assignment today, you are not going to be using the HDFS. Actual production runs of Hadoop will use HDFS, uh, but it takes effort to set up HDFS. So to simplify your life, you are going to be running Hadoop over local files um, on a single machine, but the principles are the same. So whatever you do in principle can be uh, easily real targeted to running on a, on files which are stored in a distributed file system, HDFS. So that data is replicated and there is a central name node which provides metadata. Uh, so if you want to open a file, you talk to the name node, the name node will tell you. Uh, which blocks are contained in the file and where all it's replicated. Now the name node is central. If it fails, you're in trouble. So HDFS keeps a replica of the name node, one replica, which is uh, up to date. It has all the data that the uh, live replica of the name node has. The backup replica has everything which is up to date. So if this crashes, the other one can take over. Okay, now let's get to specifics of MapReduce in Hadoop. Uh, we looked at abstract MapReduce with uh, types as strings and so forth. In Hadoop, you have to give types for all of these. Uh, so in Hadoop, there is a mapper and a reducer interface uh, which you have to implement. These are generics. What are generics in Java? If you are not familiar with it, a generic is a class or an interface which can take types as parameters. So in the context of Hadoop, the mapper and reducer interfaces take uh, two parameters each. The parameters are the types of the input key and the input value, and the types of the output key and output value. 
now what do I mean by input key input value? The input key and the input value are the map input key and value. The map output something which is the output key and output value. So, its types are also needed. It turns out that the output of map is the input to reduce. So, the output key type and output value type of map must match the output uh, the input key type and input value type of reduce. And reduce in turn has a output um, uh, key and value whose types can also be specified. So, each actually takes four, uh, four types. So, the mapper interface is a generic which takes four types. And I will show you the thing in the next slide, but in our example uh, the input key type is going to be long writable which is a long integer. Now, why long integer? Files can be very big uh, more than uh, gigabyte, more than four gigabytes. So, 32 bit integer is not enough. So, we are going to use long int. And in our word count example, the uh, key is a offset into a file. We are not actually going to use the key, uh, but the Hadoop system provides the key. So, it like I said it can break large files into pieces. Uh, so, when it uh, gives a uh, and, and furthermore uh, it is going to call the map on each record in the file. So, we are going to set up the thing such that each line is a record. So, Hadoop will identify the line by giving the uh, offset of the start of the line in the file. So, that is the key. We are not actually going to use the key, but it, it has to be there. Uh, the value is all or part of a document. In our context, we are a value is a record which is one line uh, of a file. Uh, so, its type is text, okay, that is the string type for Hadoop. Similarly, the output is of type uh, output key is of type text because it is a word, and the output value is of type int writable, which is an integer value. Int writable is Hadoop's. Uh, version of integer. So, with that in mind, uh, let us uh, look at the mapper, uh, the map class, which extends the mapper interface. It takes four types, long writable, which is the offset in the file, text, which in our uh, case would be a single line, uh, text, which is the output key, that is the word, int writable, which is the count of that word. And this class has uh, uh, this is actually an optimization. It has an int writable uh, variable which is final static means it cannot be updated called 1 which is a new int writable of 1. This is a optimization. So, it does not keep creating more and more objects of type int writable. It reuses the same object many times, uh, but it is not essential. It could do it. It is an optimization. It could create new copies each time. Uh, then it has a private text word equal to uh, new text. Okay, so, that is a word. Now, uh, what it is doing is the map function uh, takes a key and a text value and a context which provides other information. Uh, in, uh, in particular, that context tells us where to output the uh, key value pairs which are going to be assigned to the reduce function. It provides many other things, the context. It throws two types of exceptions. Uh, we are not going to worry about that in our pseudocode. So, the first thing it, this function does is line equal to value dot to string. So, value is text and it is converting it to a string because string is the type which uh, we can deal with in uh, normal Java code. Now, we are building a string tokenizer, new string tokenizer on this input line. So, that is going to break it up into words. The default tokenizer breaks up based on space and other white uh, space characters, new lines and so forth. So, the tokenizer is uh, basically an iterator. Uh, so, you can call next on it to get tokens. So, the while loop says while tokenizer dot has more tokens, um, word dot set tokenizer dot next token. What is this doing? The next token gives us the next word in that input line. So, the tokenizer breaks up the line into words and while it has more tokens, pull the next word and word dot set. What is uh, word here? Uh, word is uh, this text field. So, the next word in the input line is saved in this word and then we are outputting word comma 1. So, what is going on here? Um, the 1 is simply this count 1. Um, it is an optimization to create it as an object. 
and that word with the value 1 is being output here. So, that is a map function. Similarly, the reduce class uh, is extends the reducer function. So, <coughs> that is a requirement. Now, by the way, mm, I want to mention that there can be many uh, map functions which need to be executed in the, pro in the uh, course of one large job. So, there can be many such classes. The name map is not important here. It can be any name. Inside this, there is a function map. Um, so, that function uh, has to be called map, but this thing can be called anything you want and we will see how to uh, launch a job which does one map job after another later. Similarly, the class reduce here, uh, this is one class, you can have more classes with different names here, extends reducer, again the reducer takes four parameters, uh, four types rather, this is the reduce key, reduce uh, value, output key output value. So, those are the four types. So, we have decided that this is a word and int is the count and the output is the word with the final count. So, text and int writable. Now, the reduce function is called with the following parameters in Hadoop. The first is the reduce key which is of we have said is type text. So, that is text here. Now, next is the uh, reduce value is uh, int writable. The reduce function is called with a number of these values. So, that type that it is called with has to be iterable parameterized by int writable. So, this is again a Hadoop specific. Iterable is a uh, basically an iterator which itself is parameterized by the type and that same type which is declared here has to be specified here. Uh, so, this is iterable int writables value. So, this is the second parameter to the reduce function. The third parameter again is the context which provides various things. Uh, here it is used to uh, output the final uh, key value, the final count for the word. Again, it throws a couple of exceptions, which we are ignoring here. So, the reduce function does something very simple. Sum is set to 0. Now, uh, it is uh, says for int writable val colon values. This is the Java syntax for going over uh, iterator. So, this is an iterator. Uh, so, if you say um, for something colon values, values is an iterator. So, here I specify a local variable val whose type is int writable. Now, note that this is a, a number of int writables. So, this val had better be of type int writable. So, that is part of the for loop. This is Java uh, 6 syntax if you are not familiar with it. Uh, this is how you can step over all the values in an iterator. Values is an iterator. So, now it says val dot get. Now, val is an int writable. Int writable dot get returns an integer value and I am just adding that to sum. Sum is 0. Initially, I keep adding. So, the idea here is that many map functions might have returned the same word with different counts. Now, all those counts are added up here to get the final count for a particular word. And finally, I write key that is the word and new int writable of sum. So, that is the uh, sum the total count for that word. So, that completes the map and reduce functions. Uh, the next set of things are how to set up the job parameters, uh, but before I get into that, uh, I would like to take some questions in case people have not understood the map and reduce function. Okay, we have uh, Pandai Periyar Vellur, please go ahead. In what are the language we embed Adobe? In Java only, in other language. Uh, take the question as I understood it. Uh, the question I think was, uh, what all languages can you do uh, map reduce in? The example I have shown is using Java, but the Hadoop platform actually has uh, uh, plugins to handle many other languages. So, you can uh, write your uh, map reduce code in uh, one of m many, many other languages. Um, so, what happens is the Hadoop system is built using Java. There are many languages which can be compiled down to Java bytecode. So, any of those languages can be used with Hadoop because the map and reduce functions can be written in those languages, but compiled down to the same bytecode and the Hadoop infrastructure simply executes the bytecode. It does not care what language the bytecode was written in. Uh, so, as long as the type system matches uh, the Hadoop type system. Uh, so, there are uh, 
um, MapReduce things available for many languages in, Hadoop, in the Hadoop framework itself. If you have any other question, please go ahead. Sir, we have another question. What is the equivalent command in PostgreSQL like ls we are using in Linux? So the question is in Linux, uh, we use ls to see uh, what uh, files are there in a directory. What is the equivalent in PostgreSQL? This is not big data related, but a quick answer is uh, if you are using the PSQL command line prompt, there is a there are a slash commands, just type slash help and you will see a list of commands. And uh, uh, so I think there is a slash dt or something which shows a list of tables and then there are variants of that to show different things. Um, or if you use a, a graphical interface, that provides it for you. If you use PG admin, it provides that. But let us focus on big data questions today if you do not mind. So uh, let me take some chat questions here. So. Uh, one of the questions which was asked is, uh, do we have to use for each or for in the MapReduce code? So maybe, uh, you know, my pseudo code might have uh, confused you. So let me make this clear. Hadoop is described here and the Java syntax which I have shown here works with Hadoop. If you go back to before Hadoop was introduced, we use a lot of pseudo code. None of this will work in Hadoop. This is pure pseudo code. It is not meant to work on any system. So the for each loop is not a real construct, it is not Java construct, it is pseudocode. I used some other uh, code here uh, which uh, looked more like Java, but this is also pseudocode. This is not going to run on Hadoop. I cannot say if date between, you know, this is not valid Java syntax. This is not, this is pseudocode. So do not use any, any of these things in Hadoop. Use only the Java constructs which you are familiar with or uh, the constructs which are used here can be used. Uh, the, const the This for loop on iterators, uh, even if you are not familiar with it, I think from this example you should get a hang of what it is and you can use it. Uh, so uh, you, you are most welcome to use that. Um, now let me see if there are any other things. So people are asking about uh, are there guidelines for partitioning in big data. Again, Hadoop has a lot of configuration parameters. We are not going to touch on most of them. But we do have to touch on a few to get your uh, program running and that is the next thing that I am going to talk about. So let me come, there are no other uh, questions directly related to uh, today's uh, Hadoop uh, code. So let me uh, go ahead and tell you the next part of Hadoop which is uh, the job parameters and how do you set up an overall uh, program in Hadoop. So these are the next two slides. So far I only showed you the map and reduce function. But you have to do a lot more to get your job running. Well, a little bit more, not a lot more. Uh, the first thing is uh, that uh, you have to tell Hadoop which classes contain the map and reduce functions. I sort of mentioned this earlier. You know, I told you that this class is called map and this class is called reduce, uh, but your program can have many such classes with different names. It does not matter what they are called. So you have to tell, uh, you have to set up a Hadoop job and you can run multiple Hadoop jobs one after another. Each Hadoop job needs to be told that this is the map class and this is the reduce class. So uh, there are two methods, set mapper class and set reducer class, which you have to call and we will show that in the next slide to tell it which map function and which reduce function to use in this job. You also have to tell the job what are the types of the output key and value. So that you have to do using set output key class and output value class. This is for the final output. The types for the intermediate outputs are also provided in the class. You know, those are generic classes. So those provide the other type. Uh, but Hadoop uh, job has to be told about the final output type. Now the input format is another important thing. You know, I kind of fudge saying that uh, somehow the system gives you input key and input value uh, from a set of files. But how does it decide uh, what are these keys and what are the values. Now these are functions which you can also uh, give uh, implementations of, uh, but the simplest thing is to use one of the um, built-in things. Uh, the default format in Hadoop is the text input format. The text input format says that I have a number of files. Each line of each file is a record by itself. So the new line character uh, breaks a line. and so each line is a um, uh, separate record by itself. Uh, so the value is the contents of one line. 
and the key is the byte offset into the file. The file name is not part of the key, uh, but the context parameter which is uh, passed to the map function has the file name uh, accessible from the context. So if you need it, that is also available. Uh, so the set input format class, there are other formats available which can uh, break the thing into records based on some other uh, terminator for record. Or you can even create your own which uh, lets you parse the file and break it up into records. Uh, then the next thing is where is the input data and where is the output data. So the uh, way Hadoop does this is you provide directories. So you say add input path and add output path. So input path is a directory which contains files. So Hadoop will process all the files in that directory. That directory may contain a large number of files, that is okay. It will process all of them and they are all part of the input. Uh, the output path tells it where to store the output. Now if you saw our earlier figure, each uh, reduce function outputs reduce key and value. Now the reduce functions run on a number of machines, m different machines here. So each machine is going to create uh, one or more files and the output directory is where all these files will be stored. So they will have various names and you will see that in the lab today, mm, sorry I overshot here. So the add output path specifies which directory the uh, files should, output files are to be stored in. So when you run a program, you first have to create a directory and store all your input files in that directory. And in the program, you have to say add input path with that directory. There are many more parameters, we are not going to cover all of them, most have default values. So here is our overall Hadoop program for word count. So the main uh, uh, function is in another class, class word count can call this whatever you want. And that thing should have a public static void main string arg. So that has to be defined and it can throw some exceptions. This is setting up the job and executing it. What is it doing? Configuration conf equal to new configuration. So configuration is um, the stuff which sets up all the parameters. Now we say job, job equal to new job conf, this previous configuration. And there is a name for it called word count. So that's to identify the job. Now, for the job, we are setting various parameters. In this case, uh, we have not really altered any configuration parameters. But if we wished to, if it were really running parallelly, we could set the number of reduce uh, machines, the number of uh, map uh, machines, and so on. Actually, tasks. Ta a task is like a machine. So number of map tasks, number of reduce tasks, and so on can be set here. We have not set it. So all the configuration parameters are default. In fact, the way we are running it, it's just a single machine. So that's the default for the single machine version. Okay, so now we have to tell the job that the output key class is text and output value class is int writable. So text dot class, int writable dot class. This is a way of telling it, the classes of the input, uh, output key and value. Similarly, uh, we have to tell it which are the a map and reduce function, which classes contain those. So job dot set mapper class, map dot class. So note map is the function we and, and reduce are the functions we define here. Okay, reduce and map. Um, map. We could have called these whatever we want. This name map and this name reduce are what we use here. So set mapper class, map dot class, set reducer class, reduce dot class. Then we set the input format to text input format dot class. So we could have also defined our own thing and used this instead here. Similarly, output format, we are saying text output format dot class, which says that it's a file with, uh, you know, one uh, line per record and the record will have the key and value. And then uh, we say file input format dot add input path job comma new path arg zero. So what is going on here? First of all, this word count program is going to be invoked with two parameters. The first parameter is a path, uh, is the input directory, uh, which contains the input files. Um, so now, when I say new path with arg0, arg0 is the command line argument with the directory name. So path with the name which we have provided uh, basically creates a path, and we are saying uh, add input path for that. Uh, and the next one is for the output. So the 
second argument to the uh, call is the output directory. Uh, now, it, in general, you should uh, delete this directory and it will create it automatically. And um, so, we are set, saying set output path with that directory name. So, when the job runs, it will create that directory if it is not present and fill it with as many files as required. Now, we have set up the whole thing and then we say job dot wait for completion true. So, wait for completion means start the job and then wait for it to complete when I, because I have said true. If I said job dot wait for completion false, this will return immediately and let me do other stuff while that job is executing. The job may take some time to execute. Uh, it is running on big data potentially, it may take a long time to execute. So, meanwhile I can do other stuff, but in this case it is my program is just going to wait and when the job finishes, the program will return. So, that completes the whole program which we have for today's lab. The first thing you will be doing in today's lab is running this program, making sure it runs. The second thing you will be doing is modifying this program to do some uh, very simple change in the functionality. Okay. So, the bulk of your lab will be actually in setting up the environment. The environment is a little uh, finicky, uh, there is a bunch of stuff you have to do. Uh, so, please follow the instructions in the lab carefully today. If you miss out some steps in those instructions, you will get into trouble, you will get error messages. So, please follow the steps religiously, uh, in particular there are some environment variables and so on which you should not miss. Mm, so, all of this has to run on Linux. Now, when your workshop coordinators were here. Uh, some of them said that uh, they have problems, uh, they, they do not have Linux, they have only Windows. Uh, and a few people tried to set up uh, Windows, uh, uh, set up Hadoop on Windows. Um, that is actually again not trivial. There is a Hadoop port which runs on Windows server, but uh, I do not think that port runs on normal Windows uh, uh, 7 or Windows 8 non server versions. Uh, so, uh, if you have only windows in your lab, you have a problem. You may not be able to do today's lab at all. Uh, I do hope that there are not too many centers in this uh, soup. I hope all centers have been able to install uh, Linux and run Hadoop. Um, but those centers which could not, please report this uh, to us and we can follow up. Those of you who are in such centers, uh, you know, please go back later, get access to a Linux machine and do this lab on your own. And if you have trouble, uh, you can use Piazza to post uh, your questions and there will be somebody answering your questions. Uh, we have Apex Institute Bhubaneswar, if you have some questions, please go ahead. So, what is the disadvantages of replication and what are the technique used to replicate file? Uh, the question was on replication, right, what are the disadvantages? Uh, the disadvantage is obvious, you have to have more disk space. But it is essential uh, in such large systems because there is a high chance that some disk somewhere will fail. Uh, so, you absolutely need replication to uh, build any large system like uh, with thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, the, can, the main thing you can control is how much replication to use. Should you use two way, three way or more? Or uh, maybe if you do not do two way replication, maybe you can use uh, some version of RAID may be parity bits stored in other places rather than full replication. So, all of these are actually used, uh, I am not getting into those details, but uh, many of these things are under the control of the configuration for say HDFS or other similar systems. There are other uh, distributed file systems out there. Any follow up question? Okay, sir. Next question in the big data that is the handbook technology generally used for the parallel. Uh, parallel uh, splitting the file and parallel processing. Hmm. And the wh what is the basic difference with the Hadoop technology and the slicing technology in the data mining? The slicing technology in data mining. Slicing technology in the data mining. I don't know what you mean by slicing. Slicing in technique, that is. Uh, all of the. So I, I'm not sure what is slicing in data mining, but there are many different. Uh, uh, you know projects and approaches to parallel processing, but at the core they are all similar. You have to partition the data in some way and then process it and then maybe combine the results with some repartitioning and so on. So, whether it is parallel databases or Hadoop, uh, the basic principles are the same. Okay, we can take uh, some other question from some other center. 
Sri Ramakrishna Coimbatore, please go ahead. So one question, does Hadoop replace database or other existing system? The question is, does Hadoop replace Hello? databases or existing systems? Uh, that is a good question. How does Hadoop compare with databases? Should it replace databases? I am going to talk about that in the last part of my uh, big data presentation. So I will come back to that question. Uh, so I will defer the question now. I do have slides on this and I will talk about it. Selvam College, Namakkal. Sir, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, how big data can be used in cloud computing areas? So several people have asked this question about big data and cloud computing. So first of all, uh, let me explain to those of you who are not familiar, what is cloud computing? In cloud computing, you don't have a uh, machine sitting in your location, but somebody has a large number of machines out there and is willing to rent them out to you, uh, either at the level of machines or they will rent, uh, you know, use of <coughs> some service, maybe use of a platform, for example, Google Docs, let us you store documents online, that is an example of cloud computing. Uh, but Amazon uh, gives, and there are others, but Amazon is one of the big players here. You can go to Amazon and <coughs> rent machines by the year, month, year, even by the hour. You can rent a machine by an hour. Actually, it is a, not a full machine, but a virtual machine, which might be shared with a few other virtual machines. You can rent it by the hour. So cloud compassing and cloud Computing encompasses all of these kinds of things. Uh, now, what's the connection between big data and cloud computing? So you could run a platform like Hadoop locally on machines which you have bought, uh, which is uh, probably okay for academic institutes because we tend to have labs with uh, 40, 50, 60 machines. I mean, I see on the video that many of you are sitting in labs of that kind of size. And uh, you can very well run Hadoop on across uh, 40, 50 machines in the lab and do pretty useful, you know, 50 is not bad. Uh, you can do a lot of parallel processing with that. But if you want to run Hadoop with re really large data with 1,000 machines, setting up your own cluster of 1,000 machines for occasional use is crazy. You just, uh, you're much better off going uh, and renting those machines by the hour from Amazon. <clears throat> so there are many people who use uh, Amazon to run uh, Hadoop. In fact, Amazon now offers a service where you can uh, basically get an instance of Hadoop running. Uh, you don't have to rent the machine, you run, rent the Hadoop service, and you have to, of course, give them the map reduce functions, the job config, and so forth, and they will uh, end the data, and they will run it for you and give the results. So that's the connection between big data and cloud computing. Okay, thank you, sir. Government Engineering College, Bikanir. If you have a question, please go ahead. Can we do map reading on video data also, sir? The map reduce paradigm, uh, you can do anything you want in the map and the reduce functions. Uh, you can also have map only jobs, you just do a map and nothing else. So uh, there are people who use uh, this infrastructure to do uh, all kinds of things which are database unrelated. For example, um, there are uh, people who want to do uh, video transcoding. Let's say you have recorded video <coughs> for this lecture at a certain frame rate. Uh, you also want to convert it to other frame rates uh, for people who have a lower uh, uh, bandwidth connection. Now, in the case of AVU, this is done, I think, on the fly. Uh, but there are people who allow people, you know, like YouTube equivalents, which let you upload a file and then you have to convert it. And there's a lot of these jobs which need to be done. So people have used MapReduce where the map function simply does uh, video transcoding, for example. Uh, so what is the benefit of doing it? Uh, well, you get uh, fault tolerance. You uh, have uh, the ability to store these files in a distributed file system, HDFS. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, this infrastructure is used for many kinds of things which have nothing to do with databases because it provides a fault tolerant parallel processing uh, setup. And so it's used for that aspect, not for the data. Now, the reduce part of it is more data related and uh, things which use map and reduce tend to be database related. So in fact, uh, somebody was asking about the connection between Hadoop and um, databases. So Hadoop is a very low level infrastructure. Databases provide you a much higher level view. So uh, people have uh, tried to provide a high level view that databases provide, including SQL, on top of underlying Hadoop implementation. 
People have also said that the Hadoop implementation is not very good for uh, data based query processing. Uh, it's actually not very good, to be honest. Uh, you can do things much more efficiently if you built something specifically for data processing, not as a general purpose platform. And so now there are several uh, platforms which are tailored to uh, you know, these kinds of things. And I'll, I have a few slides on that coming up. I'll take a couple of questions from chat. <coughs> So I'll uh, look at a few of these things. Um, one of the uh, questions says, can you explain Hadoop with practical implementation? We do have this word count program. And today's lab, you will be actually running Hadoop program. So it's very much part of the syllabus. Uh, the next question is, can we use Hadoop for implementation of machine learning algorithms, which are recursive in nature? Uh, that's a good question. The Hadoop job consists of a map task and then a reduce task. Now, uh, what if you want to do something more complex, which has to iterate or recurse? Uh, recursion and iteration uh, can, you know, one can replace the other. So uh, if you have a machine learning task which needs multiple iterations, how do you do it on Hadoop? And the answer is, in that main program which we saw, we set up a job and ran it. It's possible to set up a sequence of jobs and run them one after another iteratively. So it's very much possible in Hadoop, but possible is not equal to efficient. So people have noted that it's not very efficient when you do such iterative things. There are better ways of doing stuff. Uh, so there are uh, several platforms which have, uh, so first of all, Hadoop itself, there is a new version called Yarn, which is uh, in beta right now, uh, but it's already quite usable, which has better support for iteration. And then there are many other platforms which people have built for specific purposes. For example, for graph algorithms, I mentioned Pregel. Uh, that is much more efficient for iterative processing of graph algorithms. And then there are other things which people have built for iteration. Uh, the next question on chat is uh, something about memory error while running the Hadoop test examples given on the Moodle website. Uh, please help. I'm not sure about this particular problem. I have not seen it myself. Uh, maybe you can post it on Piazza and somebody can take a look at it. But we, have, we didn't see this on anything going on here. Um, one possibility is that your machine has very little memory, but that, uh, or you have uh, many other tasks running on your machine, which means it's out of uh, virtual memory and now you're in trouble. So maybe you should close other processes and just run Hadoop, nothing else. Next question is, how can we use Hadoop in information retrieval, uh, especially web information retrieval? So your lab assignment is to modify the Hadoop pro word count program we have given to make a small change, which essentially is like one step in building a, a index, web uh, index, an, an inverted index as it's called. Inverted indices are the core for web search systems. So you're going to do an assignment which is not really build an index, but take one step towards building an index. So when you do your assignment, that will become more clear. Uh, it's not a very hard assignment, but it's the first step in building an index. Uh, the other part, which is for web crawling, uh, yes, Hadoop, uh, I believe, is also being used for web crawling, uh, but there were some limitations. It was used extensively for web crawling. It probably still is in many places. But Google, which pioneered uh, using their MapReduce for in, in, even for processing uh, websites and indexing, have actually moved to an alt native architecture, uh, which uh, I forget the name, um, but they have a new system which uh, is tailored to uh, web indexing. You can use Hadoop for this uh, or general Google MapReduce, uh, but they have a system which uh, has some performance improvements over the raw MapReduce. So that is what they are using internally, I believe. Okay. The last question which I will take from chat is, um, after range partitioning, what does the reduce function do? The idea is as follows. Range partitioning is used to ensure that uh, all records with a particular key land up in one machine. But now that machine has to, uh, is getting such records from many other machines. So if we uh, go to the whiteboard, so this was a range partitioning vector. Um, which means that a particular machine here, P0, gets everything with G less than 10. Now, there are many mappers which have uh, generated values with G less than 10, let's say. All of that comes to this machine. But 
for a particular g value, let us say 7, it has to collect all the records with g equal to 7. So, what happens is after the range partitioning, each machine uh, does a merge, uh, the, the things which it gets are already pre sorted. It does a merge to get a final sorted list of all key values. And once it has that, it can invoke the reduce function on specific key values. So, the final sorted list has everything with key value 7 together, it can call the reduce function on all those values with key 7. So, that is how that step works. Uh, may, maybe I will take another one or two quest, live questions, then I will move back to my slides. We have BSA College, Uttar Pradesh, Tisgad. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, can we use map reduce for uh, business intelligence? Can, uh, yes, certainly. Um, so, uh, this is an active area. A uh, lot of companies in the BI space are uh, working on map reduce implementations. Uh, now, the thing is, BI uh, was focused on uh, you know systems which use SQL as the backend. The initial map reduce systems were not SQL systems; they were different. The Hadoop is not SQL. So, uh, interfacing an existing uh, BI system to uh, such uh, Hadoop framework was not easy. But in uh, the last few years, there is a, a new uh, layer on top of Hadoop called Hive. It is actually not just a layer, the implementation is currently on Hadoop. But now, there are new implementations of Hive uh, on other infrastructures. What does Hive provide? It provides SQL on top of uh, such big data. So, Hive can run on top of a MapReduce platform. It can take SQL queries and uh, run them and give back results and run them using Hadoop underneath. So, you can uh, run these on very large data sets. So, now that Hive is available, uh, people have started uh, building business intelligence tools using Hive as the backend. They generate SQL, let Hive execute the SQL. Um, so, that is a very active area right now. Okay, so uh, any follow up? Okay, good. So let's move back to these slides and let me wrap up big data. Uh, before we move to a short description of Hive and so forth, uh, let me start with one other technical thing. Um, let me show the figure for this. Okay. So here, uh, what happened is each map task. Uh, collected, uh, it, it ran map on a number of values here and then uh, it collects those values and then partitions them to all the reducers. Now, if you saw our word count program, if you see map, map outputs a word with a count of 1. Supposing a particular machine has a number of documents, large number of documents. Now, the same word may occur many times in one document and many time, more times across documents. Now, if you send this output across the network to a reducer, the network overhead is going to be very high. You do not want, network is a bottleneck today. It turns out that typical machines today uh, use gigabit ethernet. 10 gigabit ethernet is still considered very expensive. Uh, whereas, a machine typically has several hard disks and each hard disk can pump out uh, 50, 60 megabytes of information. So, you can generate data here much faster than the network can handle. So, you want to reduce network traffic. So, the idea is that supposing we have, we can do some kind of local reduce within the machine and do some sorting, collect all occurrence of a word together and add up their counts. Okay. So, that idea is implemented directly in Hadoop through what is called local pre-aggregation to minimize network traffic. So, um, in Hadoop, there is a call in the job configuration to use combiner. Okay. When, uh, so, if you turn on this option, it will use the reduce function as is uh, locally once. And the output of that reduce function is fed to the main reduce function. Okay. This works fine as long as the input and output types of the reduce function are the same. Uh, if the input and output types of the reduce function are different, you run into trouble. In which case, you can create your own combiner function uh, and it has its own input and output types and reduce can have its own input and output types. Okay. So, uh, I am not showing details here, you can look it up. In fact, the combiner can work at two levels, one is within a machine and uh, if you look at the architecture of most data centers, 
there are a number of machines uh, in racks and let me use the whiteboard to explain this. So, if you look at typical data center, it has a number of racks ok. This is um, what a rack kind of looks like and it has a number of these racks. Each rack has a number of servers, they are very thin, they are uh, like a inch or so high. So, now a rack has a number of these. So, a very common number is something like 40 or so machines in a rack uh, and in the rack there is a switch typically a 48 port switch ok. Now, there are many more such racks. So, then there is another switch here which is connected to each rack. Now, typically these are 10 gigabit per second and the network connections inside the rack are 1 gigabit per second. This is a very typical setup. This may change over time to faster things, but this is what is common today. So, the idea is that um, if you look there are uh, 40 machines here, if they all start throwing traffic across to other racks, uh, you are going to generate 40 gigabits, gigabits per second, whereas this network can only handle 10 gigabits per second. So, it is good to reduce the traffic coming out of a machine, it is also good to reduce the traffic going out of a rack. So, in fact, you can uh, set up Hadoop to run a combiner for all the data in a machine, then you send all the data to uh, one of the machines in the rack, uh, which will again uh, in fact not just one, you can parallelize this also, but you can do a reduce step inside the rack to further reduce the data volume and then you uh, you know send the data across to machines which are in other racks. So, at each step you do a combiner uh, run pass which reduces the amount of data. So, that is uh, supported in Hadoop. Now, what about uh, implementations? MapReduce uh, in this scale was pioneered by Google, but they do not open source very much. Uh, Hadoop is open source uh, thanks to Yahoo and uh, there are other implementations which combine databases with MapReduce. Somebody had asked this question, how do databases and MapReduce combine? So, there are several different answers. One of the answers was you take an existing database system, a parallel database system and add support for the MapReduce paradigm in it. So, Aster Data, which uh, if you recall I had mentioned was uh, one of the co-founders was a uh, person from IIT Bombay called Mayank Bhava. So, uh, they were, uh, they pioneered uh, you know MapReduce within parallel databases uh, and there are others. Um, but there is a completely different approach which is now gaining traction. Uh, so, to understand that uh, let us compare MapReduce versus parallel database. So, there is a lot of discussion about this. So, MapReduce is widely used, lots and lots of people are using it. Even in India, there are many companies which are using Hadoop, particularly Hadoop is used, I should say. Compute page rank, build keyword indices, do data analysis of web click logs, so on and so on, many, many uses. Uh, but if you see many of these things, not all, uh, maybe not keyword indices, but analysis of web click logs, it is actually easier to do it in SQL than to do it in Hadoop. And database people said, look, we have been doing it for a long time uh, and uh, we know better how to handle this kind of data for simple query processing. And the Hadoop people came back and said, look, you people may say you have built parallel databases, but they are very expensive, nobody actually owns them and uh, they run at hundreds, not thousands of machines scale. And we are much better at handling failures. We allow procedural code in map and reduce and data of any type, ok. So, that is true. On the other hand, uh, many of the uses of map reduce turned out that they actually use structured data or data which can easily be converted to structured form and then you do aggregates. Now, for this SQL is actually a much better language for expressing what you want than hand coding using Hadoop. It is actually uh, crazy how much effort you have to put to create a Hadoop program, which you will see today uh, to do something simple. Uh, which you could write as a two line SQL program. The word, uh, word count you cannot do exactly in SQL, but some of the other things are much easier to write in SQL. So, once people realize this, uh, they built <coughs> other interfaces which provided declarative languages on top of MapReduce. So, the first uh, project in this space uh, built a language called Pig Latin, uh, which is not SQL, but is more like relational algebra and you can 
uh, have a number of operations on data. Um, so uh, this came from Yahoo, and this was open source by Yahoo. So you can actually use this. You can download and use it. Uh, but uh, soon after this, Facebook had a different project called Hive, which uh, they decided forget new languages. Let's use SQL itself as a language. Maybe a subset of SQL, but it's SQL still. And the other thing they did is that they said, uh, look, the Hadoop says files can be any old text format, but let us put a restriction that the files have to have a schema associated with them and a way to take the raw data in the files and output fields, some structured format, uh, which can then be uh, consumed by the SQL system. Uh, otherwise, if for every file, you have to build your own parsing routine. That's not good. Let's have a standard format for files. Of course, if you have a, a web, uh, a, you know, web server which generates a log in its own format, um, then you have to add uh, to the formats that Hive supports to understand that. But there are only a few such. So Hive has a notion of schema for every piece of data it has. So it's much closer to SQL in that sense, and it supports the SQL language. Uh, so this is now very, very widely used. Hive has really taken over from raw Hadoop. Many people who are using raw Hadoop for data analysis have moved to Hive. Of course, Hadoop continues to be very widely used for things which cannot be expressed in SQL. And there are many such uses. But those which can be done in SQL are quickly migrating to Hive. There's also a system called Scope from Microsoft which does similar things. And finally, there are many extensions of the MapReduce paradigm itself to add joins, pipelining of data, blah, blah, blah. I won't get into the details to make it more efficient. So that's the state of the world. Hadoop uh, is being uh, is still used as the underlying infrastructure, but there's a layer on top called Hive, which is widely used. Now, there's a last part which I want to wrap up uh, big data with. So far, we've been focusing on the decision support. We have a lot of data. We want to do analysis using the data. Now, the other part is, if you want to store, update, retrieve data, uh, files are not the right format for it. Uh, Files are fine if you just have uh, logs and so on, which don't get updated. Uh, but there are many uses which are more OLTP-like. So uh, if you want to store records, uh, which can be individually accessed, uh, updated, and so forth, files are not the answer. So again here, Google built the first system which addressed this particular issue called Bigtable. This is a really cool system because they give you an abstraction of a table with more features, actually, than basic tables. You can uh, retrieve records. You can store records in this table. The records themselves can have further structure. They are not necessarily first normal form. Uh, and the key thing here is that these tables can be enormous. They can be you know, many terabytes, even petabytes. And that uh, view, a logical view of a table is provided, but the actual physical thing table is stored across potentially tens of thousands of machines. And the nice thing is that as the table grows, you can incrementally grow the system also by adding more processors to the system. And big table will, uh, you know, smoothly migrate a little by little, little more data into the new processors. It will not; it doesn't have to bring the system to a halt ever. So this was a really nice system. And uh, once they published it, or people heard about it, uh, they wanted to build their own. So Yahoo built a system called Peanuts. And more recently, Apache built a system called HBase. This is open source. Peanuts is not. So HBase is now wide, uh, open source and widely used now. Many people are using HBase. And all of these provide what is called a key value store. It's not a full-fledged database. You can. Uh, give a key, like a record with a primary key. You can give the primary key and the content of the record and say store this. And you can give the primary key and say retrieve the record. What uh, these things lack is the uh, support for indices other than the index on the primary key. Again, people have, after they were, these systems were built, they started adding support for secondary keys and um, transactions and so on. Uh, so that's still an active area. Uh, which uh, you know is under development. So if you use HBase, you're not going to get too many functions in terms of secondary indices or transactions. Uh, but 
people are developing such systems a few years from now. Open source may be available. Uh, Google has already built these in-house. Uh, so they have actually built massively parallel data, scalable database systems which have SQL and all the bells and whistles of database, or most of the bells and whistles of databases. But it runs across enormous numbers of machines. So that's uh, uh, getting popular within Google and eventually you'll get publicly uh, available uh, open source clones. Last few questions on big data. Uh, Bansal College, Bhopal. Sir, my question is, what is the basic difference between RDBMS and Hadoop? The question is, what is the difference between RDBMS and Hadoop? So Hadoop is a layer which provides just a few functionality, right? It just provides map and reduce, which you can run in parallel across many machines with fault tolerance. It's not a database at all. And the point I was making in the last few slides is that you can build a database on top of Hadoop. In particular, if that database is focused on decision support, so you want parallel query processing, uh, you can build it and Hive is exactly such a system. It's a database which supports SQL which is built on the Hadoop infrastructure. So Hive is the underlying execution engine for, uh, sorry, Hadoop is the execution engine for Hive. That's the basic relationship between Hadoop and uh, database system. Now Hive itself is, uh, provides an SQL layer. Now, uh, people are actually building Hive implementations which are sitting not on Hadoop but on other infrastructure which is more suited to database uh, operations. So that is the next wave in Hive. Uh, there are some commercial systems already available which claim much better performance than Hive on Hadoop. So it's Hive on some other infrastructure which is uh, much faster than Hive on Hadoop. Uh, this is from GRIET, Kukatpalli. Sir, uh, may, look, may not to uh, what is the difference uh, between HBS and HDFC, HDFS, sir? Uh, HBS and HDFS. Okay. It's a good question. So let me just use the slide here. Okay. So the question is, what is the difference between HBS and HDFS? HDFS is a uh, file system. You can store files. In, just like in your local machine, you can create files. Uh, you know, you can write to files, you can read files. HDFS provides exactly this interface. The only difference is that the files are stored across a large number of machines and it has replication and fault tolerance and all that built in. So if a machine dies, HDFS can continue to live and provide you access to those files. HBase provides similar functionality but for records. And uh, what it does is it's uh, called uh, uh, key values store. By key value, what we mean is that a record must have a key, like a primary key of the record, and the value is the value of the record. And the only way to access a record is by uh, specifying a key value and the system will retrieve the record. Or you can give a key and a value and it will store the record. So it just supports two basic operations, get and put. There are some extensions, but these are the two basic operations. So this is what HBase provides. It's not a full-fledged database on its own. So now you could again take Hive and uh, make it run on Hadoop. So by the way, um, Hadoop is MapReduce. Hadoop so far I've been talking of running on top of HDFS. Hadoop also can run on top of HBase. Okay, so you can store records in HBase and then run a Hadoop program uh, directly off the HBase uh, storage. So it doesn't have to be HDFS. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And one more question is there. What is the function of mapper, sir? Okay, the question is, uh, what is the function of mappers? So I already told you that you have to write a map function and a reduce function. Uh, mapper is basically a, a task which runs these map functions on multiple uh, key value pairs. So uh, that, that, that's a map task. So mapper is, is a task that runs these map functions. Similarly, reducer is the thing which runs the reduce functions. Uh, we have uh, Sushila Danchan Ghodavat. Please go ahead. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, my question is uh, whether uh, on our desktop computers and with uh, Linux or Windows, can we have Hadoop on it or, and uh, which is the 
other than have is there any database system which can support the underlying uh, hadoop file system sir thank you sir. okay uh, good question so first of all hadoop uh, was built on linux systems uh, and it can run on your desktop very easily its resource consumption is very small particularly if you just run it in single machine mode that's the default mode we run it in uh, hadoop uh, can also be configured to run across many machines then there is some more work to set it up so uh, we have not put that in your lab but you can certainly follow the instructions which are available and set it up across all the machines in your lab i can see your lab has lots of machines so you can run hadoop in uh, parallel across all those machines now coming to the windows part um so microsoft uh, realized that hadoop is very widely used initially they built their own uh, things um, called dryad and scope which is a layer on which is a database layer on top of dryad dryad is their uh, equivalent of hadoop unfortunately uh, in the market uh, dryad didn't do that well so now microsoft has also paid uh, this company uh, called uh, what is it called uh, i forget the name it it has uh, paid this company to build a windows port of hadoop so that port is currently available for windows server uh, not yet for windows desktop uh, so as of now i believe it's difficult to run hadoop on a windows desktop some people have ported uh, you know sigwin and which is provides linux functionality on windows and is more complex uh, but you can't do it more straightforward manner right now i'm sure that will change uh, what is the last part of your question right sure right uh, what is the last part of your question uh, is there any uh, other uh, database uh, systems other than hive which can support uh, hadoop underlying uh, system so uh, many people have uh, been developing projects which uh, do several different things one is uh, replace hadoop by extensions of hadoop or new things which uh, can support hadoop as well as other relational operations such as uh, join and so on which hadoop does not support natively you can code joins in hadoop but it's more uh, cumbersome and slower uh, so many people have been working on layers underneath hadoop and changing the underlying implementation and also many people including some of the same people have been uh, building uh, other uh, uh, systems which will run sql on top of hadoop or other similar systems so there are quite a few projects out there uh, but the hive project has really taken off um, and uh, it's kind of becoming the accepted uh, standard so you might as well go with that as of now uh, we have rvs college coimbatore please go ahead rvs so uh, how to handle unstructured data using hadoop with respect to map reducing algorithm unstructured data oh. how to handle unstructured data using hadoop so let me answer that question the question is how to uh, handle unstructured data using hadoop uh, the word count program which we just saw was unstructured data the number of files and uh, we are uh, breaking up the files into lines and counting the words in each line uh, you might alternatively not break it up into lines you can treat the whole file as one record and do word count per file and there but the bottom line is that example directly shows how we can do and um, un use unstructured data uh, and run hadoop uh, programs on it and your lab exercise is to uh, like i said uh, take the first steps towards building a keyword index so that is also something which is uh, functionality on unstructured data uh, which you will be using hadoop for so our goal here was not to have you do sql on hadoop which like i said you might as well use hive if that's what you're doing uh, but to get exposure doing other kinds of things on hadoop which you will still need even if you have hive if you want to do uh, things like this uh, word count is a toy but other operations on unstructured data uh, hive is not going to solve that problem for you you will have to go back to hadoop so that is our goal in the hadoop assignment okay i'll take a maybe a couple of uh, questions from chat difference between map reduce database and parallel database like i said uh, we can build parallel uh, databases on top of the map reduce infrastructure or you can build it uh, on some other relational parallel relational engine that is traditional parallel databases had an underlying engine which could run all the relational operations in parallel join uh, group by aggregate uh, you know uh, auto join um, duplicate elimination sorting all of these 
there are parallel versions and the parallel database chapter in the textbook talks about how to do all this. So, traditional parallel databases used this as the underlying infrastructure and ran SQL queries on top of the relation, parallel relational operations. Uh, the Hadoop infrastructure does not directly support these operations, but you can work around it and implement the operations. That is what Hive did initially. Uh, but more recently, uh, people have built other implementations and put Hive on top of it. So, what you get is uh, essentially back to a parallel database um, after removing Hadoop from underneath. Uh, people have asked about how to check status and health of cluster in Hadoop. Um, so, I do not have the details, but there are uh, tools which can let you uh, monitor what a Hadoop cluster is doing. So, you can search on the web to find these tools. I think it comes with uh, Hadoop. Uh, if, you, if you download Hadoop uh, sources, it comes with that. Okay. Uh, last one or two questions. One question is, what is fault tolerance in HDFS? Okay, so, fault tolerance means that in spite of something failing, uh, you should be able to continue uh, executing your system. In the context of HDFS, uh, when one of the machines which contains data fails, it is okay. There is a replica somewhere else. HDFS will uh, tell you where the replicas are located, so you can go read it from there. And the read, uh, HDFS provides an API. So, the read function in that will do all that underneath. You do not have to worry about it. You just say read and it will get you the data from whichever copy is live. So, that is fault tolerance in HDFS. Uh, there is also fault tolerance in Hadoop. It says if a map task fails, Hadoop will automatically re-execute that map task on some other machine. That machine may be dead, the task will be executed somewhere else. Even if one of the machines is slow, all the other machines have finished their map task, but one machine has not uh, yet finished. It is live, but it is running very slowly. Hadoop will automatically execute that map task on some other machine in parallel, and whichever finishes first will be taken. So, if this machine was very slow for some reason, the other machine will uh, finish and get the result. If this was a temporary glitch and this machine actually caught up, well, this ones can be used. Uh, similarly, if a reduced task fails, Hadoop will re-execute the reduced task and generate the output files. Uh, so, there is a lot of fault tolerance built into Hadoop and, and similarly Google MapReduce. Okay. So, I think I will uh, stop on Hadoop and big data here. Mm.